Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture two. And in this segment, we're going to actually introduce the pressure gradient force and how to actually quantify it in the atmosphere. So with that, let's actually go ahead and revisit Newton's second law for a quick moment here. So the next several lectures are going to be devoted towards resolving this particular term. So we're trying to figure out all the different forces that act on uh, all the fluids in the atmosphere. And what, the first one that we're going to look at is, of course, the pressure gradient force. But there are other forces that we have to worry about as well, such as the Coriolis force and the centrifugal force, which are two forces that are a consequence of having a planet that rotates, a spherical object that rotates. But uh, we'll get to those as needed. And then also gravity and friction are some other forces that we have to worry about. But just for this immediate lecture, we're only going to worry about the pressure gradient force and then worry about the other forces uh, as we need to. So the whole idea behind the pressure gradient force is uh, its nature attempting to resolve an imbalance. Uh, a very common theme in uh, in the in nature is just that it doesn't like nature does not like things to be imbalanced, and uh, oftentimes nature tries to resolve imbalances by moving higher values towards lower values, and this is true for a lot of different quantities. Uh, uh, for instance, if you have a high concentration, you may remember from chemistry classes, if you have a high concentration of a chemical, that high concentration wants to move towards lower concentrations. And the same rule also applies to temperature. If you have an area that's really hot and an area that's really cold, then nature wants to move the hot air towards the cold air. The same also applies for uh, pressure differences. If you have an area of high pressure, an area of low pressure, such as what's depicted in the diagram here, high pressure represented by the blue H, low pressure represented by the red L, then nature wants to resolve that difference by moving the higher pressure towards the lower pressure. And this in turn results in a force. It has to, uh, you have to basically accelerate the air. And in order to accelerate the air to resolve this imbalance, in order to have that acceleration, there has to be a force involved. And uh, if there is a force involved, then uh, it'd be nice to know how to actually how to actually quantify that so that we can uh, effectively model the atmosphere. And <clears throat> excuse me. Now this force. Uh, a few things to note about this force itself. Uh, there's a few things that are a couple, a few intuitive and physical uh, properties that are important to keep in mind about the pressure gradient force. Is it is proportional to the overall difference in pressure. So if this is a very, if this is an area of very high pressure and this is an area of very low pressure, then the force is naturally going to be much stronger. Versus if this is a weak high pressure versus a weak area of low pressure, then the force is not going to be as strong. And another thing that might be worth keeping in mind, or it might be worth examining, is what do you do if the pressure centers, if the differences in pressure are spread farther apart? So if this, in this top row I have an area of high pressure and an area of low pressure that are much farther apart than on this bottom section here. So intuitively, we might expect the force, the pressure gradient force, to be much stronger if the pressure differences or the pressure imbalance is much closer together, and that is in fact what we typically observe in the atmosphere. If you have, uh, if you if you have the same pressures, then the force is going to be is going to be partially dictated by the distance between those two pressures. So, since this high and this low are really close together compared to this high and this low, we expect this force to be stronger, and we expect this force to be weaker. So, the pressure gradient force is in fact inversely proportional to the, di the uh, distance between uh, two pressure, uh, two different pressures, a high pressure and a low pressure. And another thing that's kind of important to keep in mind is this is also inversely proportional to fluid density. So if you have a, a, an air, uh, if you have a fluid that's not as dense, then it's a lot easier to move. It's a lot easier for nature to resolve that pressure uh, difference, which means a faster acceleration, which uh, implies a stronger force that is involved. And there is a derivation to arrive at this mathematical equation, but it's kind of involved and kind of complicated. It involves a lot of uh, three-dimensional geometry, which we're not going to go into. But uh, I can just go ahead and give you the equation and just check to make sure that it actually makes sense. So the pressure gradient force is equal to negative 1 over rho times the pressure gradient. And remember, gradient vector, this is in fact a vector quantity. So that means the pressure gradient force is also a vector quantity which means if you expand this out to what it represents, it's minus 1 over rho times dp dx i hat plus dp dy j hat plus dp dz k hat. And you can see it accounts for all the factors that we highlighted up here. 
If the difference in pressure is very large, that means this numerator is very large, which means our pressure gradient force is very large. If our distance in pressure is very large, if our distances between the pressures are very large, then this term is small. The denominator is large, meaning this term is small, meaning we have a weaker pressure gradient force. And then also this factor of density out in front here, if our fluid is less dense, then we have a stronger pressure gradient force because it's easier for that fluid to accelerate, which again we highlighted in this point up here. Now I'll go ahead and pose the following question uh, to you to also sort of check your understanding on the gradient on the gradient vector. Why is there a minus sign out in front? In fact, feel free to even pause the video and think about why the negative sign is out in front and see if you can arrive at an answer. All right, so now I'll go ahead and answer the question that was posed, why the negative sign is out in front. If we go back to the uh, conceptual diagram that we started with, we have area of high pressure over here, area of lower pressure over here. From the strict mathematical definition of the gradient vector, the gradient vector points from low values of some scalar quantity to higher values of some scalar quantity, which means our pressure gradient, the pressure gradient vector is going to point from lower values of pressure to higher values of pressure, which means it'll look something like this. Now the pressure gradient force itself points in the opposite direction. It points from higher pressure to lower pressure. So the gradient vector points from lower pressure to higher pressure, but the pressure gradient force, that is nature's attempt to resolve the imbalance, that pressure gradient force points from higher pressure to lower pressure. And since these two vectors point in opposite directions, that's where we pick up this negative sign out in front here. So the since the force and the pressure gradient point in opposite directions, that's where we pick up this negative sign. And if we want to incorporate all that into our equations of motion, we can go ahead and update those. So we get pretty much the same terms that we started with in the zonal component. We get, there should be negative signs out in front there, du dt is equal to negative v dot del u plus minus one over rho dp dx. That's the x component of the pressure gradient force. And then same thing for the y and z components. Again, there should be a negative there and a negative is there. Uh, I gotta do a better job keeping track of my negative signs because those are kind of important, but there should be negative signs out in front of these v vector terms here. And then also we still have the sum of all the mass normalized forces, which we will again add to as we progress through the class, uh, talking about the Coriolis force and the centrifugal force and all that. And if we want to take a look at sort of a real world application of where this might be useful, so this is a weather map that I pulled from the ECMWF, the European, the European Center for Medium, Medium Weather Range Weather Forecasting Model. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful there that my tongue couldn't quite, uh, tongue couldn't quite get out correctly. But uh, if you take a look at this map, we have a fairly intense low over here in South Dakota and a fairly intense high up in uh, Canada. And you can see the isobars, which are the lines of constant pressure, you can see the isobars are packed pretty tight together and that in turn indicates the presence of a strong pressure gradient. And if your pressure gradient is really strong, that means your pressure gradient force is also quite strong. And also that would therefore imply that the winds itself are also very strong since uh, a strong pressure gradient force would tend to result in stronger accelerations. Stronger accelerations therefore imply a stronger wind. So a stronger pressure gradient usually indicates the presence of stronger winds. And if we look at this case down here in the southeast, you can see the isobars are spaced much farther apart, indicating the presence of a weaker pressure gradient, which means a weaker pressure gradient force, and that usually indicates a weaker wind field as well. Now, this is a look at a surface map, in which we have highs and lows. I'm going to go ahead and put another uh, put up another wet weather map that we like to look at, which is something like a 500 millibar map, where everything being plotted is on a constant pressure surface. You're plotting all the information that is occurring at a pressure level of 500 millibars. Now, here's the problem that with the equation that we used: everything that's being depicted on this map is at the same pressure level. So uh, that raises problems with the equation that we were trying to use before, which depends on the differences in pressure, but uh, that then raises the question, how do we resolve the pressure gradient force on a map like this, where all the uh, the values, that, the contours that you see plotted here are the heights, what we call the heights, which is basically the height in the atmosphere at which the pressure is 500 millibars. So 546, uh, this uh, 546 contour here, that height, of, that height of 546 basically means that uh, 
the pressure level is 500 millibars at 546 decameters or around 5,460 5, meters above ground level. And then similarly, uh, 570, a height of 570 means the pressure is 500 millibars at a height of 5,700 meters. So that's a, uh, a bit of a clarification of what's going on here, but that does raise the question, how, do we, how exactly do we diagnose pressure gradient force on a map like this, on a 500 millibar map where the pressure is the same everywhere? The answer to that question will be in the following segment. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.